Doesn't look like a Casper the Ghost, you know, like he's, but knee maybe is going to drop out in a minute. So one of the things we want to do that we never in this hospital we never bowl a sickle cell patients unless there's a real reason. I mean, obviously, you know, you support blood pressure with fluid if you have to, but unless somebody comes in truly, truly, emergently dehydrated. We don't give boluses. And that's because their heart is already strained because they have chronic anemia. And you can push them over into failure and pulmonary complications very easy. So we usually, in the emergency room, we use 1.25 times maintenance and get, to get through it that way. Um, and some places they use up to, I just came from a, a, a pediatric emergency conference and most people use between 1.25 and 1.5 percent maintenance and stay away from bolus in patients with sickle cell. Oxygen. Oxygen has been one of those things that we gave to everybody for everything thinking it could help everything. There's never been a study that showed that oxygen even though this is a disease that hypoxia to the tissue, that giving oxygen makes any more hypo um, blood flow to the tissues. So we only give oxygen to sickle cell patients if they are have decreased pulse oxygen. So, uh, and often what we have to do is when we see a decreased pulse ox, we have to put the pulse ox in the air because for some reason we get a, a tour reading if we put it on the ear versus the, the finger. But very seldom do we give oxygen to, uh, you know, if they had acute chest and they were had sacs in the 90s or uh, 80s, then they would get oxygen. But very seldom do we give patients uh, oxygen. But that's also true now of people with MIs. You know, everybody used to get oxygen, and now the, the recommendations are less you're hypoxic, you don't give people with MIs oxygen. Oxygen, can, too much oxygen can be bad. Just like, you know, in uh, neonates, you're very careful about the percent of oxygen because it can cause permanent damage if they're in a constant state of hyperoxia. Okay, so let's talk about what we do for pain crisis. We want an 18 centers that have a grant from the feds to study <coughs> painful crisis and a different way of attacking painful crisis. These centers are both adult and pediatric centers. Most of them are university or academic centers, but some are not. And basically, our goal is, one, to educate people that it's not up to you to decide how much pain the patient with sickle cell or need is. We don't do that with cancer patients. You don't say, when well, your cancer patient said, I'm in pain, you don't say, I don't look like, you don't look like you're in pain. <laughs> but I've heard people say that to sickle cell patients. That is not your priority. That is not what you're about. You know, you, you know, if they say they're in pain, in the acute setting, it's our job to believe they're in pain and treat pain. Now, and if you're a hematologist and you follow them, or you're a psychiatrist and you follow them, then you might may be able to make different determinations. But for acute determination, that's not our job. Okay, they're in pain. They say they're in pain, they're in pain. So that's the first thing that we have to recognize. So our protocol gives large doses of narcotics quickly. So we give 0.1 kilo of morphine, or we give dilated a lot too, because some people can't tolerate morphine, or prefer dilated. And we give it every 15 minutes, if they have a pain score of five or greater. Now, 18 places across the country, actually it's more than that, but it started with 18 cases. We don't do it as it was really set up to do, because 
children have their own problems, we couldn't work that out. In the other places, this is totally nurse driven, not physician driven. Mm. The nurse determines the kid has a pain score of five or greater, there's a standing order set, she gives him the next dose of medicine at that 15 minute point. And the reason it's nurse driven, because you'll never get a physician to be in there every 15 minutes. It's just not going to happen. And it hasn't happened. But just having a protocol, our average time between doses of medicine was almost two hours. We're down to, we track everything. We tr I can tell you what every patient you came in, how long it took between each dose of medicine. We track it all as part of our protocol. We track everything. And so we've gone from an hour and a half to two hours between doses to probably 35 minutes, which is a remarkable you know, decrease, but still not the 15 minutes that it should be. But it, it's, re it's remarkable, and it's all because we went to this new protocol. So in this hospital, the way the protocol works, a patient comes in, I'm ha I have sickle cell, I have a pain. Now we have one adult patient that comes in, doesn't have sickle cell, and claim, you know, just to get the narcotics. But she's well known. <laughs> you know, we happen to have Holland residents, and basically they told me she doesn't have sickle cell. She comes in all the time. So now we know. <laughs> so besides that, you know, I mean, if, if I, we'll get blood work with everybody. If you have a hemoglobin of, or a hematocrit of 48, you don't have sickle cell. Okay, so you might get one me dose of medicine out of me, but you won't get two. <laughs> you keep going home. And in Holland, they actually call the police on you. <laughs> because you actually committed a fraud to get a, a scheduled drug. You know, not that they get arrested, but you know, they have to give them a scare and you know, let them know that they could be arrested for that. But as far as I know, it's only happened once. <laughs> Kids don't usually come in saying that. But we often get adults because they're, you know, we give children, almost, we take care of almost probably 80% of all the children with sickle cell in, in the East Bay. Some go to Kaiser, but pretty much we take care of most of them. We have got them used to a different standard. When you come to Children's Hospital ED, you are a priority. You're seen right away if you have painful crisis. You go to Highland or Summit or Alta Bates and you're in a painful crisis. And I know this firsthand because I actually have been the director, medical director of sickle cell camp for many years and had to take adults to these places when they had crisis at camp. Some of them will work with Children's Hospital. And Basically, we sat out in the waiting area for an hour. That would never happen in children's hospital. So people know that. So the adults all sometimes will come to our hospital because they know they're treated differently here than they are at the adult institution. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Bell, by early treatment of these um, occlusive crises, you also find there's a decrease in emissions. We have not. Um, we have, we, some centers have, but if we look at the, 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 the data overall, overall, we do not find that it has decreased emissions, but it certainly has, when we look at surveys from the, from the people involved, it, it has increased their level of comfort, their satisfaction with the medical system. Um, there are some people that I know when they come in, they're going to be admitted. Because they're always admitted. Right, along the same line, does it decrease length of stay of hospitalization? No. There is some data that it does decrease the length of hospitalization. One thing that I wanted to get to, we have a new protocol going on right now, where we're giving some of these people low-dose ketamine. Now, this is a very exciting thing to me. 
because there's only so much narcotics can do for anybody. You know, the idea is if you break the pain cycle, and that's probably why it doesn't decrease emission. These people use it in pain for a while before they even come in. And the ones who don't come in are the ones who self-treated themselves at home with narcotics. So the idea, if you, we give a very small dose of ketamine, and if we can break the pain crisis, then hopefully, just like migraines, migraines are the same thing. You get people with bad migraines, you know, often nothing will work. You give them everything, but we're starting to use ketamine in them too, because you, you reset the chronic pain, um, and you give them a relief for, for a little while, and hopefully that resets their their pain thresholds. So we're doing a study right now, or we should be starting soon, where we're going to you know, give people the choice of they'll get one dose of narcotics, and then they'll have a choice of whether they want to try a low dose of ketamine. Uh, they're already giving ketamine on the floors, I believe, to sickle cell patients, certain patients. Because there's some kids, like he said, no matter how much narcotic that they, they, they you give them, they don't get any relief. So we've got to try things that work differently. How much ketamine are we talking about, Dr. Bell? Like, how many, mil, how many milligrams per, per, per kilo or what? Like, like what's... It's, we do it's one? about uh, a fifth of what we normally give for sedation. Okay, a fifth. Is there any benefit to um, like arterial dilation to allow there, for more passage of the there, sickle cell? There are drugs. Uh, I went to a sickle cell conference and there was a, evidently Dr. Krasinski is on the board of some company that works on sickle cell drugs of the future. But they are working on drugs that directly affect the, option, the, the ability of the tissues to get more um, blood from the sickle cell. Nothing, as far as I know, is on the market yet. So nothing that we're using. But there are trials going on with experimental drugs to do that. To like open up the vessel so that the clot can the so cell can pass, blow, yeah. or oxygen can increase. Yeah. Oh. Dr. Bell, at triage, patients are often given an option to have intranasal fentanyl. Has that been successful? Why or why not? Okay, let's talk about the whole idea about intranasal fentanyl. Intranasal fentanyl works. We use it in emergency all the times. If you break your kick breaks his arm, before we get an IV in, we'll probably offer them intranasal fentanyl. So it just makes sense that often sickle cell patients want a hard IV stick, especially the chronic ones that come in all the time, that we have another way of giving them their first dose of medicine uh, to, to help them through their painful crisis. So that's the why intranasal fentanyl came as part of the protocol. Mm. Now, a lot of kids don't like something shot up their nose. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people don't want it, but a lot of people think it's great, especially if you're a hard IV stick and you might not get IV medicines for 15, 20 minutes, uh, it's, and you're really in pain for crisis, you'd be glad to get into medicine. Why not oral? Why not oral medication? Because intranasal works faster okay. and but if they better than oral. But if they don't want it up their nose, is oral, do we do oh, off yeah, oral? Oh yeah, we can give it oral. Oh, okay. But usually they already been taken oral. You know, almost all sickle cell patients have narcotics at home. <laughs> so, that, you know, whether it's hydrocodone or something else, that they, they have something, they have a pain plan, they have a plan that they're supposed to use when they get painful crisis before they even come to the emergency room. And they're supposed to call the hematologist before they come in so he can see if there's anything else that they can do as an outpatient. Thank you. Um, could you speak uh, about how the transition works between pediatric facilities and 
adult facilities and I you always hear about that, Doesn't oh, work. this patient has sent it to it. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. Because I always hear that about this elusive contract. But like, what does that really mean? And there's, is there a consequence to breaking the contract? And who writes the contract? Is it? Well, you know, at one time, Alta Bates had the strict contract for adult sickle cell. But they were getting hard care. Very bad care at all. So children's got a contract to take care of adult sickle cell patients as outpatients. Obviously, we didn't want to admit all the adults here. So we, they come and get all their outpatient care here in our clinic. And then when they're admitted, they're admitted to Southern or Alta Bates. Now, there is a, a process where they're supposed to make a transition from pediatric to adult care, and then they're supposed to be admitted at Alta Bates versus here. But the sicker kids tend to not make that transition to later on in life. Uh, you know, because we, we normally think of transition about 18, 19, but we have some 23, 25 yep. that's still, you know, here. I am just going to comment on that because I work with the sick team a lot. They do an amazing job transitioning on the outpatient basis. They start really young, but it is exactly that. When, when they have to go to the ED or even come in to <coughs> the day hospital, um, they would prefer to come to the day hospital. And then there's all the money. The reality of money is we have to boot a lot of our adult freezes patients out of like we're losing money. And so that's to get the community to absorb that was a disaster. Um, and then you might also be talking about pain contracts, which is also a whole different thing. Um, and that the whole sickle team and social work and um, work with individual patients who are you know, your frequent flyers or who are starting to get into the psychological aspects of having pain but also being addicted to, to it, um, they do huge and amazing complex pain contracts um, as a whole team. And, um, and they, they try to enforce it, but you know, it's a different type of different time. And, you know, Alta Base used to give like $500,000 to children to take care of the adult uh, sickle cell patients. And they decided at some point they were no longer going to do that. So that was a big struggle. And I'm not sure how it turned out, but uh, it's, it's a constant point. Does Dr. Watson still have that program we had when he was trying to help the young adult transition and so we go to more I don't know if Dr. Watson is still doing that. That's all, always been a problem, not just here. This is a national problem. I talk to the people at St. Jude who have probably the best pediatric program because they have unlimited funds. You know, you, you go to St. Jude, you don't, nobody gets a bill. You know, they have unlimited funds. But when you transition, they can't find doctors to take the sickle cell adult patients. Black, white, green, or yellow, they can't find physicians to do it because they require so much care, most people don't want them in their practice, don't want to take care of them in the hospital. Even here, you know, one of the big problems is we have, we had two adult doctors used to take care of them in the hospital. Now, when they come to our emergency, we used to direct admit them to uh, uh, ward service. Now he doesn't admit there anymore. So we have to go through their normal things. It takes us about three hours to get anybody transferred from children to Alta Bates. They often don't see a hematologist while they're there. I've had stories that told me about people who are sickle cell patients who work here who say they basically have to call Bajinsky on their cell phone and tell him to come and see me because nobody's you know, seen them while they're in the hospital. Besides the hospitalists who often just not expert in sickle cell pain or, or complications. So there's certainly, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, there's a drop off of care from children to adults. I've had adult patients come from the ward at Ulta Bay, IV still in their arm, show up at triage. Oh, sure. And, and I can't blame them. You know, even though we can't sustain that, you know, 
But I don't blame them. I've, you know, I had an elderly parent and had to take her to the adult ER several times, and I would see sickle cell patients in the in the hallways and in in the waiting areas just writhing in pain. Never would happen at our institution. But to be fair, sometimes they got three MIs going on at the same time. You know, they have a higher acuity unit. So it's it's a complicated situation. And like I said, you know, as I go to these national meetings, it's it's better here than it is most places, and it's not good here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dell, don't they have a total um, sickle cell program at Highland? No. Is that resolved? No. They do not have a sickle cell patient problem. Matter of fact, they see very few sickle cell patients at Highland. We do have a pretty um, strong immunity group, and Group that is advocating uh, you know, amongst the providers and for the patients in, in, in Oakland, and that's probably why. Yeah, and there was some talk, but even though our CEO is a former human, is a hematologist and started the sickle cell program mm -hmm. here, um, evidently he made some in, in some talks about moving the adult program to Highland, and he almost got roasted. <laughs> was not did not go over well with his own people or the people with sickle cell. <laughs> Especially since you know people heard about it through the grapevine and weren't told exactly. You know, so that was mixed. Once it became public, that was that was mixed. I think it's wonderful what you're saying about <clears throat> how quickly uh, your patients here at Children to get treated for pain in sickle cell. But at other EDs, as you mentioned, um, it is complicated because they are 